Some people think that this ugly monstrosity looks more like a Soviet bomb shelter than a civic building in a historical city, or that it's a bombastic piece of urban renewal from the late 1960s, it's not attractive, or it hurts the eyes just walking by it. While a certain set of others, they have a more optimistic view and think that building is a notable achievement in the uses of monumentality and humanity, or one of America's foremost landmarks, arguably the great building of 20th century Boston. Opinions about the brutalist Boston City Hall are divided, to say the least. On the one side, you have people with critical thinking skills and working eyesight. On the other, you have architects. They notoriously wear glasses, and they hold all sorts of ridiculous, contrarian opinions that just flies in the face of common sense. You might think that their illogical points of view makes them sound smart. After all, they're standing strong in the face of overwhelming criticism. Maybe brutalism is an acquired taste, like Malort, the official liqueur of Chicago. Or on the other hand, you might think that their purported like of brutalism, it's all just a ruse, some sort of cosmic joke played by architects to gaslight the rest of the world. If that's true, there must be a secret playbook that organizes their united front. Well, it turns out that all those things are true. And in this video, I'm gonna share that secret playbook. I'm gonna give you the best five talking points for pretending that you like brutalist architecture. After watching and committing these five simple facts to memory, you too will be able to look smart. You'll be able to deploy these points anytime that you hear someone on the street pretending to admire some sort of fine specimen, or when you see someone on the internet making a disparaging comment about those concrete monstrosities from the 1960s. Well, when artfully strung together, these five reasons will help you build a case for liking brutalism that's just as solid and easy to defend as those concrete structures that you're pretending to like. You can trust me. I'm an architectural professor with a master's degree from Princeton University, and I work inside of the largest collection of brutalist buildings in Chicago. And I love it. We can start with a simple one. The first line of defense for pretending to like brutalism should always be about how unfortunate it is that we call the style brutalism in the first place. The name alone really goes a long way to weed out the uninitiated. So what if I told you that brutalist buildings aren't really brutal at all? That name for the style is actually the result of a bad translation of a French word. It has nothing to do with how we understand the term brutal in English. So brutalism, the word, is like croissantwich. It started as a beautiful French thing, then found an unfortunate, tasteless interpretation in English. I don't speak French, so I'll let a native speaker pronounce the original phrase. Beton brut, beton brut, beton brut. Beton brut is the term we use for raw concrete in buildings. I started here with this point for liking brutalism as number one because it really establishes an air of pretension and authority. French lessons and undermining the very terms that we're dealing with really destabilizes the foundation of those that you're attempting to convince. Brutalist buildings are just made of concrete and subject to an unfortunate translation. You see, some English folks coined the term new brutalism in the 1950s to connect with the Swiss French architect Le Corbusier. Yeah, him. They wanted to connect their stuff to his earlier projects like L'unité d'habitation par Le Corbusier à Marseille, France, is made with béton brut. Those English speakers needed a fancy new name for their work to make their own cheap, stupidly simple buildings just sound cool. To really hit with that one-two punch, I would follow up with a comment about how brutalism is not just an aesthetic for individual buildings. Each one shouldn't be thought of as a, like an isolated fragment in a, in a floating in a metropolis. It's more accurately understood as a movement underpinned by a utopian socialist ideology. And it's important to get that phrase right, utopian socialist ideology. Brutalist structures are a means for achieving an integrated and thoughtful way of life, a life where every individual knows their role in the collective. Look at the Barbican, for instance, a full city in a brutalist getup. It has housing and a theater and nature and stores all woven together in a confusing 3D matrix of slabs, walls, and walkways. Contrary to what you might think, the massive, ugly, and imposing structures are more like a byproduct of this utopian thinking. The ultimate goal is to create communal spaces and promote social cohesion all through architecture. You can think of their massiveness as like a physical manifestation of the burden that's placed on them by carrying the weight of creating such a perfect society. Large open spaces, they're meant to be as generous offerings for communal gatherings of people. They aren't vast, windswept hellscapes. The solidity of the structures themselves, then, they offer shelter and identifiable, enduring monuments for those that are gathering. Take the Boston City Hall, for instance. The entry sequence provides a grand, unbroken connection between the outdoor plaza and all the way into the interior heart of the building, which is an open atrium. So while you're far away from it, it appears massive and solid, 
the experience of engaging the building is actually quite open and connected. Never mind the mayor's office that's hovering over you like a, like a watchful guardian. That should be reassuring. And like the city hall, a lot of brutalist buildings often hold institutions that are meant for the public good at large, like universities or government agencies or police stations. So these vast spaces that are inside and outside of these structures are perfect for all of the community events that no one ever attends. And in the rare cases that people actually do attend, the structures offer great photo backdrops while absorbing the wear and tear that these events might bring. And to be honest, this is kind of the point of these things, to give people a platform to assemble and to speak their mind. Utopian socialist ideology. All right, we're to point three now in case you're keeping track. In light of all these things, many people think that brutalism is about creating defensible buildings. You know, riots during the 1960s prompted institutions to hunker down and build fortresses. But it's not that at all. That's more like a perk than a driving motivation for the decisions. The reality was that the building materials they were getting scarce during the 1960s. Concrete is made of simple and abundant ingredients you can get almost anywhere. While at the same time, it doesn't require the same kind of skilled craftsmanship as say a building that's made out of stone. Those conditions were coupled with an unprecedented need for lots of new buildings. Maybe war destroyed your city and you had to rebuild like in London. Or maybe you just bulldozed your own city like here in Chicago. Either way, lots of buildings was coupled with scarcity of materials. That's how you get lots of raw concrete constructions. But there's more to all this than just the concrete too. The large open spaces are flexible to be able to accommodate changing uses over time. And this ensures that the buildings will remain useful for longer. The tough concrete exteriors should also need less maintenance than other kinds of constructions. So it should be cheaper to own and operate in the long run. While that's true between you and me, these buildings are pretty difficult to modify after the fact. And when they do need to be fixed, that can be difficult too. But anyway, brutalism is about an honest expression of the building's construction and its structure. And we can all get behind that, right? The logical follow-up with point number four is to use the worst of contemporary construction as your straw man argument. Today, buildings are thin, they're flimsy, and they're flat. Sleek glass and metal facades, they lack character, and they don't age well as they inevitably get dirty over time. New buildings are like your iPhone in your pocket. It looks messed up just with fingerprints on the screen. And you're supposed to touch it. You touch it all the time. It's a, it's a touch screen. You can't avoid it. So it's always doomed to be compromised. A glorious brutalist structure is like an old leather wallet in your other pocket. It gets better with age as the materials weather and they gather imperfections over time. Brutalist designs have deep, textured, and rhythmic facades. While they might feel out of place sometimes, it's reminiscent of old classical structures from the Greek and Roman days. These deep facades play with light and shadow in the sunlight, creating a rich visual tapestry. And concrete ages gracefully, gaining patina over time as it becomes more planted into its context. It's like that old leather wallet that's been molded specifically to your butt after you've sat on it for years. Point five is really just a last resort. You pull it out only if there's still lingering questions around the sincerity of your love for brutalism. The goal here is to dazzle your opponent by name dropping architects in films that prominently feature brutalist structures as settings for their stories. This maybe also has the added benefit of offering a change of subject in case everyone's getting bored talking about architecture for so long. Anyway, prominent architects of brutalism include folks like I.M. Pei. He won the Prisker Prize, so you know he's good. And he's left such gems as the Syracuse University Newhouse School, or the Everson Museum, or the LaFont Plaza in Washington, D.C., and of course, the Dallas Civic Center. Who could forget that one? Look at this beauty. Then you have Allison and Peter Smithsons, who are those English folks who coined the name, and uh, Paul Rudolph, he's a good one to throw in there. I mean, he designed the Yale Architecture School. That's prestigious. When choosing films, though, try to stick with ones that shine a positive light on the style, like The Hunger Games. Oof, no, not that one. Or um, 1984. Oh, God, no, definitely not that one. A Clockwork Orange. No, no. Uh, high right. God. Forget those. Forget the film idea. You don't need it. By now, you've made your case. Brutalism, it isn't brutal. It's an honest expression of materials in the pursuit of a utopian socialist ideology practiced by the best architects in the game. Boom, I'm convinced. I'm also convinced that I'm freezing cold and need something to warm up. These are exactly the times when I head straight into the kitchen to make some coffee. And for the last few months, I've been enjoying something new and special from Trade Coffee that's delivered to me every couple of weeks. This one is Sparrow's High Five Blend, and it just arrived in the signature red bag. With Trade, it's not just about buying coffee. It's about discovering your new favorites. Their curated selection has been so impressive. 
This one is super smooth, bold blend of beans, a high five in every sip. Their coffee matching service is like having your own personal barista who knows your order by heart, and all this without ever having to leave the comfort of your own home. Isn't that the kind of service that we all want? After learning a little bit about your tastes, Trade uses their algorithms to match you with over 55 of the nation's top independent roasters. A subscription to Trade will set you up to receive a new bag of carefully curated coffee at whatever interval you choose. It's a great way to experience the nation's immense coffee landscape without any of the hassle. And while you're sitting back and enjoying your last few sips, the roasters go to work timed perfectly for your next delivery so it's always fresh. No more running out of beans and no more last minute store runs. If you ever have any questions or just want to speak to someone more about your coffee, Trade's customer service and their educational resources are there to guide you through brewing the perfect cup every time. For those of you who love coffee just as much as I do and appreciate the convenience of having it delivered right to your home, Trade is offering a special deal. Head to the website at the top of the description, drinktrade.com slash Stuart Hicks, and you'll get a free bag of coffee when you subscribe. Or you can click on the link on the screen. Start your journey to discover your new favorites at drinktrade.com slash Stuart Hicks, and let your morning start with your own high five, courtesy of Trade. And as always, thanks for watching.